Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And I always do talk about Dungeons and Dragons, but the topic for today is not Samwise, which we should definitely have a video on that at some point, but not today. No, the topic is Sidekicks in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And I will be relating this back to Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League because I think a lot of this is suitable for Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League and it will come up. The other thing is it's definitely going to be useful in home games. Like everything that I put out here, this is just my opinion and there are always provisors to anything you do in your game. It's not like anything and everything should be used all the time. So one of my favourite Dungeon Master tools in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is absolutely the sidekicks that are offered and uh, the mechanics behind it. I've done a number of videos. I've done a whole bunch of videos on hirelings and animal companions and sort of tried to stress the fact that these are actually good to use in your game, particularly if you have a small group. But it's still one of my favourite sections. I'm going to say it now, kids are going to love sidekicks as pets, or not as a pet, but just playing a, a really peculiar creature, monster, animal, whatever you might like. Um, kids are just like that, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for those of you who are starting to sort of squirm a little bit, okay? It's not the only use for the sidekick. So let's have a look at the intro section. This section provides a straightforward way to add special NPCs or non-player characters called a sidekick to the group of adventurers. These rules take a creature with a low challenge rating and give it levels in one of three simple classes, the expert, the spellcaster or the warrior. A sidekick can be incorporated into a group as the party at the party's inception or the sidekick might join during the campaign. For example, the characters might meet a villager, an animal, or another creature, um, forge a relationship, invite the creature to join them on their adventures. This happens quite a lot in people's adventures. And it's not necessarily like animal companions and, and monsters and creatures. It might simply just be a, a human NPC, or an elf, or a dwarf. You can, you, you can also use these rules to customise a monster for your own use as a dungeon master. So this is a couple of things I want to pull apart here before I proceed with regard to uh, this particular section. And that is, let's answer the question, what are sidekicks good for? Why would you use them? Is there a good reason to incorporate them in your game? and you are the dungeon master, you have to answer that question. I can't do that for you, okay? All I can do is point out any problems I think you might uh, and come across. I've actually used sidekicks as a dungeon master. I've used the sidekicks from the Dungeons & Dragons Essentials Kit. I've used sidekicks before that, so it's, it's not unusual. In fact, you've probably already used a form of sidekick in your game, you just didn't realise it, okay? So the first thing is absolutely uh, a sidekick will help expand a very small adventuring group that has, say, less than four to five players. Uh, it is very hard to scale your combats and your encounters when you have less than four to five players. So therefore, this is a good time to use a sidekick. I'm not suggesting that you pump up the size of your group beyond four or five um, players and sidekicks. In fact, that's not really what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, if you have a small group, then yes, use a sidekick. Another thing that they point out, and that is, it's a quick build. A quick build for an NPC or non-player character for the Dungeon Master that is not as complex as a character class. I would like to point out that there's still a process to building them. And I wouldn't say that um, sidekicks are going to be any easier than, say, um, reskinning a monster, taking a, a monster stat block and reskinning that, or just modifying a monster stat block or an NPC stat block that already exists. Um, from what I can see so far, I think this is simply simpler than trying to build an NPC from a character class, because character classes 
are significantly more complicated. Okay, and the last thing, and that is, new players will find using a, a sidekick much easier than starting with the base classes. You know, those subclasses and base classes for characters are much more complicated than a sidekick. I would also say that many parents are already removing a lot of the complexity from the character classes so their kids can play Dungeons and Dragons. And this video is not about sidekicks and kids. For those of you who are thinking that's my focus completely, no it's not. But I would like to point out a lot of people have already been doing that for their kids. They're already removing complexity from the character classes for players. So this is not something that's completely new for those of you who are into home brewing and doing your own thing. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who do. So therefore, it's not new stuff. Okay, let's move on to creating a sidekick. A sidekick can be any type of creature with a stat block in the monster manual or another Dungeons and Dragons book. But the challenge rating and its stat block must be one half or lower. So in other words, you can't have anything more than a half or lower. You take that stat block and you add to it, as explained in <clears throat> gaining a sidekick class section. So in other words, just because it's got a low challenge rating doesn't mean anything because really all the work is done essentially as you give it a sidekick class. To join the adventurers, the sidekick must be the friend, or at least one of them must be friends with the sidekick. This friendship might be connected to a character's backstory, or to the events that have transpired in play or in your adventure. For example, a sidekick could be a childhood friend, or a pet, or it might be a creature the adventurers saved. As Dungeon Master, you determine whether there is sufficient trust established for the creature to join the group. So in other words, they've put it back onto the Dungeon Master to make the final say with this. It's not unusual for um, Wizards of the Coast to do this. They're trying to sort of make sure everybody is happy with what they're establishing. Okay, so there is a question to be asked with regard to sidekicks. You decide who plays the sidekick. Here are some options. Now they're talking about the Dungeon Master. A player plays the sidekick as their second character. <clears throat> Sorry. Ideally, when you have only one or two players. In other words, so they're suggesting that you give somebody a sidekick to control when you only have a very small group, which I've already talked about. A player plays the sidekick as their only character, ideally for a player who wants a character who's simpler than the typical player character. In other words, good for new players. It might even be that some people just don't want that complexity to have to deal with. The players jointly play the sidekicks, or you play the sidekick. That's the dungeon master. So they're trying to cover all of their bases and keep everybody happy. Ultimately, the decision is going to fall on the Dungeon Master as to who is going to play the sidekick. I think this is quite sensible. I think most people were going to do something like this. I guess this has been spelled out primarily, I think, for Dungeons & Dragons adventurous play rather than your home groups. Last section. There's no limit on the number of sidekicks in a group but having more than one per player character can noticeably slow down the game. And when establishing the difficulty of an upcoming encounter, um, count each sidekick as a character. So they're trying to say that really you can have as many as you like. Um, every player could have a sidekick. So if you had a group of five or six players, everybody could have a sidekick. That's potentially anywhere from 10 to 12 sidekicks and players being controlled by the, the players. That's quite a lot. And I think this is one section where you probably have to use your brain, okay? Otherwise, you're going to get into trouble. Uh, not limiting the number of sidekicks in your game will definitely slow it down, 
Okay, absolutely. And it's going to slow down much quicker than what they are suggesting in the book. So their advice is probably not particularly useful to you. Um, I would say that it, uh, if you don't limit your sidekicks, particularly if you have a group of four to five players, it is going to slow down far too much. I would say the total number of sidekicks and player characters at the table in the adventure at any given time, you don't really want to sort of exceed what you feel comfortable as a maximum number of players. So in other words, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League, I would imagine you don't want to have more than seven because you can have a maximum of seven at a table. You don't want a maximum of more than seven sidekicks and player characters being run at your table. That would just be appalling to deal with. Um, and I've had very large groups of players uh, in the past. It can be done. It's not necessarily that much fun for a dungeon master. It's an awful lot of work. Now, if you're playing in a home game and your preference is to have no more than five player characters or no more than six player characters or no more than four player characters, then I would say the total number of player characters and sidekicks that you want to have is going to be no more than whatever you're comfortable with. So if that number is four, then it's four. If it's five, it's five. And if it's six, it's six. Otherwise, you will slow down your game. And that is a definite reality. Okay, so the other thing I thought that was really amusing because everybody's been doing lots of research on sidekicks and what you can actually use as a sidekick. The sidekick restrictions of a challenge rating of one half or less opens up the game to very cool creatures, monsters, and sidekicks. But it also opens it up to powerful and extraordinary monsters. I mean, you are going to see some bonkers uh, sidekicks if you allow it free reign. If you do not have some restriction and the players can sort of just pick what they want, that is probably going to cause a lot of problems. I can already see videos on YouTube explaining to people, and these videos are targeted primarily at players, uh, talking about what are the best sidekicks to have. You know, if you had a half challenge rating or less, what would be the best ones to pick up? So I'm going to talk and give you an example of some of the ones that I think are probably not a great idea. If you're a dungeon master and you get suckered into using these, it's going to probably cause a lot of hassle. So my examples are, these are the ones, these are the sidekicks to be wary of. That's the jackalware with its damage immunity. Not, not <laughs> It also can actually change the way it looks, but damage immunity, not resistance, damage immunity. The blink dog with teleport. Troglodytes have three attacks. That's right, they get three attacks. They have multi-attack, they get three attacks. <laughs> That's a lot. The Zorbo, with its destructive claws. Those destructive claws can destroy magic items and weapons and armor and make them, the Zorbo, more powerful. That's a very, very dangerous combination. And that's only part of the Zorbo's features. The Seta, with its uh, pan pipes. Now, that's the variant version, you know. The variant Seta with the pan pipes. Those pan pipes can do an awful lot. And then lastly... The pixie, because the pixie has invisibility. And the thing with this invisibility is it doesn't mean that when they make a cast a spell or make an attack that they become visi invisible. It's not like the invisibility spell. It's not even like the greater invisibility spell. It just keeps going. You, the only way to really take out the pixie uh, as a sidekick is to use an area effect to sp spell, catch them, and take them down that way and you literally force them to make a concentration check or make them unconscious or kill the, um, the pixie. The other thing is pixies can cast polymorph. They can cast polymorph, that's right. That, that's an awful lot of different things that can do. So I would be wary of anybody who starts coming up to you and saying, I would really like to have a sidekick and it's any of these any of these is probably going to be a problem. And there are probably more that I have not stipulated either. Okay, let's talk about gaining a sidekick class. When you create a sidekick, you choose the class it will have for the rest of its career. 
and that is the expert, the spellcaster, or the warrior, each of which is detailed below. If a sidekick class contains a choice, you may make the choice or let the players make it. So in other words, they're basically saying that Dungeon Masters, you can make that choice, or the players can make that choice. And they're leaving it pretty much in your bull court. Here's the thing I would like to point out to you about the classes for the, um, for the sidekick. And that is that these three choices of sidekicks reduces the selection paralysis that players go through while still offering most aspects of Dungeons & Dragons characters. Besides, if you have a close look at it, sidekicks are like a Frankenstein mixture of many of the character classes and subclasses. But I would say the base um, character classes rather than the subclasses. And you'll see uh, in the wording, some of these features look very, very familiar. Okay? All right. Let's start off. What's our starting level for a sidekick? And it's got some guidance around this. The starting level of a sidekick is the same as the average level of the group. For example, if a first level group starts out with a sidekick, that sidekick is also first level. But if a 10th level group invites a sidekick to join them, that sidekick starts at 10th level. Now, the reason for stating this is because there are still some dungeon masters out there that believe that you must earn every single level and they start everybody, whether it's a player character or a sidekick or an animal companion, they all start at level one. This is simply to stop that snowball effect where everything that you throw into your game that's at low level pretty much gets destroyed because all it takes is a fireball from uh, your dungeon master's NPCs using a mage or a wizard, and that sidekick is dead. So it's trying to eliminate that problem. I think it's good guidance. I like it. I don't have an issue with this at all. It's very sensible. Leveling up a sidekick. Whenever a group's average level goes up, the sidekick gains a level. It doesn't matter how much of the group's recent adventures the sidekick experienced. The sidekick levels up because of a combination of adventuring it shared with the group and its own training. So in other words, this, what they're trying to say here is your sidekick's leveling up even if it wasn't with you for a particular part of the adventure because it was doing something else. And you may not know exactly what that is. It might have involved training. It might have meant that they um, took part in a different, different adventure with a different group of adventurers. Whatever it was, it still levels up as you level up in terms of the average level of the group. Very sensible to do. It alleviates a lot of problems because otherwise you wind up with the same problem with uh, starting off a sidekick. You know, you don't want you don't want low level sidekicks um, bumbling around with a high level group. They just will not cope. Um, it's the same problem that the Beastmaster has with their animal companion. And we already know where that goes. Okay. Hit points. Whenever the sidekicks gain a level, it gains one hit die, and its hit points maximum increases. To determine the amount of the increase, roll the hit die. The typical um, the type of die appears in the sidekick stat block. So in other words, the monster stat block actually stipulates what that hit die is. It's usually at the top where the hit points are. So you take, you roll whatever the hit, um, hit die is, or that um, dice that you're going to be using, and you're going to be adding the constitution modifier to that. It gains a minimum of one hit point per level. This is to eliminate problems where you have, if the hit die that for the sidekick is a d4, and you are adding a, a, a negative constitution modifier to that, and that could happen. You could wind up with a sidekick that doesn't get that many hit points when it levels up. And the pixie would be a very good example of that. If the sidekick drops to zero hit points and isn't killed outright, it falls unconscious and subsequently makes death saving throws just like a player character. So this is to indicate that this sidekick is just as important as the player's character. 
and otherwise you're going to have sidekicks dying left, right and centre. If that's the sort of game you want to play, then you can ignore that. If you're playing in Dungeons and Dragons Adventurers League, this is the sort of guidance you'd be giving. This is the sort of guidance I would give other people who are using animal companions and hirelings. So it's all perfectly standard as far as I'm concerned. Proficiency bonus. The sidekick's proficiency bonus is determined by its level and its class, as shown on the class table. Now there's a whole bunch of tables, I'll show them to you very shortly. Whenever the sidekick's proficiency bonus increases by one, okay, you're going to add one to the hit modifier for all of its attacks in the stat block, and you're going to increase the DC or difficulty class in its stat block by one. This is regarding um, things like a, a DC for any kind of saving throw, um, particularly if it's a caster, a spell caster, that, um, that saving throw DC will need to be adjusted. There are a couple of other things that it might affect, uh, particularly if you have a sidekick who has proficiency in a skill. And if it has proficiency in a skill, usually... The only way to tell by the stat block on a monster man, um, on the monster stat block in the monster manual, is they will actually list the skill in the stat block. That probably means that they are proficient with that skill. That's why it's there in the first place. So that means you'll probably want to adjust that as well, not just those um, two things, not just the attack to hit, and the uh, the DCs for saving throws. Okay. Next, what about the ability score increases? So ability score increases. Whenever the sidekick gains the ability score improvement feature, and most of the sidekicks do at some point, at exactly the same time as most of the other um, character classes, I don't think it's any different, um, adjust anything in the stat block that relies on the ability modifier that you increase. For example, if the sidekick has an attack that uses, say, strength modifier, increase the attack attacks modifier for the hit and damage if the um, strength modifier increases. Okay, so in other words, if you're dealing with strength and you're making strength-based attacks, then you'll need to adjust to hit modifiers and damage modifiers, okay? Pretty simple stuff. If it's unclear whether a melee, melee attack in the stat block uses dexterity or strength, the attacker can use either. So in other words, if you're not too sure which one it is, the uh, the creature can just use which whichever one. Just pick whichever one has got the highest modifier, basically. So that solves a lot of your problems. So this spelled out a lot of really good advice. It's covered a lot of the questions that I think most people are going to have with regard to actually how to build these things. Okay, I have some things to say about sidekicks. The sidekick level advance, advancement is, is quite smart. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. I mean, it's certainly simpler, but it's not that simple. But it's suitable for, say, uh, a new adult player to, to use, and some kids, say, under 12 years of age. Those are the sorts of people I think could probably handle using the sidekick, okay? You could not use the sidekicks as they are listed and detailed in Tasha's with a five-year-old child. That would be extremely difficult. I think five-year-old children are probably still going to struggle with this, and so you're going to have to strip it down even more to be able to use it with the much younger population you're playing with. And I know a lot of parents are playing at home with their kids because they're stuck there, so this is actually important information to cover. Okay. Another thing that we need to talk about, and that is, Jeremy Crawford also mentioned that you can replace the ability score improvements with a feat. I don't understand why you would even bother going here, because that defeats the whole point of the sidekick being less complicated. If you're going to do that, then just use a character class. Um, maybe this is to help wean somebody who's a new player into playing the full-fledged thing, but frankly, I don't see the point of replacing the ability score improvement with a feat when you're using a sidekick. It's one area which I sort of have a little 
yeah, I'm not I'm not too impressed by that little bit of advice, uh, frankly. But look, Wizards of the Coast and Jeremy Crawford are pretty much trying to appeal to everybody. So they pretty much say, just do whatever works for you, and here's a little bit of guidance around this. That's what they're normally doing. Okay, let's talk about the actual classes. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. What I want to do is break them down very quickly, give you a little bit of an in insight into them, and just give you a taste, because I will do follow-up videos on the expert, the spellcaster, and the warrior. They'll be more targeted for players rather than a dungeon master. This is really the dungeon master breakdown. Okay, the expert. The expert is a master of certain tasks or knowledge, favoring cunning over brawn. It might be a scout, a musician, a librarian, a clever street kid, a wily merchant, or a burglar. To gain the expert class, a creature must have at least one language in its stat block that it can speak. A sidekick gains the following class features as it gains levels, as summarized in the expert table. I would like to say that a lot of people don't like the fact that they have to speak, speak a language because they want to use some of the creatures and monsters that do not have languages. And I, frankly, I, you know, I think this is actually a good restriction. It makes a lot of sense to me. Not all of the features that the expert have, frankly, sort of suggest that you should have a language. But I don't have an issue with this. Okay, so from what you can see, you can see there are essentially what we used to call dead levels. We're looking at things like um, uh, cunning action, which is from the rogue. We're looking at things like expertise, this is very much bard. Evasion, this is yet again, this is very much the, the rogue again. You see it, obviously all of the ability score improvements. Those are good things to have because it's mechanical, it's built in, you don't have to remember this stuff. Once it's plugged into your character sheet, you're ready to go. So these are good things. And then inspiring help yet again another feature that's very much related around the bard and helping others i think the expert is a good example of what you want an, any kind of sidekick to be like i like this particular um, class for the sidekick i would say the most out of all of them other than that everything is pretty much standard I don't want to go into anything else. Um, this is not really the purpose of this particular video. Let's just talk briefly about what the expert is trying to cover. When you look at the features that it has, it is trying to cover basically the rogue and the bard. Those are the sorts of features it is trying to cover. It doesn't cover every single one of them, but it has bits and pieces that have been plucked out. Okay, spellcasters. By far the most complicated sidekick there is. A sidekick who becomes a spellcaster walks the path of magic. The sidekick might be a hedge wizard, a priest, a soothsayer, a magical performer, a person with magic in their veins. So we're really talking about a sorcerer. That's really what they're talking about there. To gain the spellcaster class, a creature must have at least one language in its stat block that it can speak. I don't have any problem with this. Makes perfect sense to me. Primarily because they are actually having to communicate and need to do that somehow. And that eliminates a lot of the sidekicks that are monsters and creatures that don't speak. A sidekick gains the following class features as it gains levels in this class as summarized in the spellcaster table. I don't want to go over all of them. You'll notice that this particular table is very sparse. Essentially, you have the level, you have the proficiency bonus, you have how many cantrips that they know, you know, they actually list how many spells they know. So again, it, it feels very much like the sorcerer. And you can see that the kinds of spells that they can cast go from level one through to level five, and they cap out at level 5. They can't do anything beyond level 5. So no level 6, 7, 8 or 9 spells. I don't have a problem with that at all. You'll notice a couple of features that 
are familiar to the wizard. So um, I believe it's potent cantrip is one. Empowered spells, those sorts of things. They're all there specifically to give you a little bit of flavor that's around the classes, but not a lot. And frankly, this is not a bad thing because casting spells is always the most complicated part of any Dungeons & Dragons game or Dungeons & Dragons 5e game. It is always the most complicated, so I have no problem with them doing it this way. <clears throat> now, what I would like to say is the spellcaster is really trying to cover aspects of the sorcerer, the cleric, uh, the druid, the bard, and the warlock because the kinds of spells you can pick very much come from those particular classes. It does actually have a little table or chart that specifies which character class you can pull your spell list from, which is good advice. Um, but there are certainly elements to all of them in the spellcaster. Okay, the last uh, sidekick is the warrior. A warrior sidekick grows in martial prowess as it fights by your side. It might be a soldier, a town guard, a battle-trained beast, or any other creature honed for combat. A sidekick gains the following class features as it gains levels in this class, as summarized in the warrior's table. Now, I would like to say <clears throat> they've done this deliberately. That means the vast majority of all those rather wacky sidekicks that you could pick up that players may gravitate towards are really only going to be the warrior, okay? They're not going to be spellcasters or experts in most cases because they have to have a language. There are still plenty that are a little bit odd. Now, the thing you'll notice with this, if they've tried to duplicate the fighter champion to a large extent, so that means you get things like Second Wind. You absolutely will be getting um, extra attack, which means you get to make more attacks than normal. Um, the ability score improvements, they're all there. <clears throat> and there's a couple of other features as well. Uh, Indomitable, I believe, is in there as well. Uh, and that those are all things that aren't bad. I would say that even with this, there is a level of complexity to it that will also chew up time because when you get extra attack that means you're making more attacks than you normally would and then you know if you get a creature that has multi-attack then they're going to be so a troglodyte has three attacks and it gets the extra attack and suddenly it's making how many attacks it's making four attacks it's making a lot more so things to bear in mind with this particular class it gives you a basic breakdown um, there are some dead levels which is fine now, the warrior also covers most aspects of the character classes. I would say we're looking at the fighter, the monk, the, the bar barbarian. I know people will say, yeah, but there's no rage there. No, but we're, you know, barbarians have extra attack. That's one of their, their features, okay? Uh, even the paladin, to a large extent, but not the magical side of them. And there has been discussion about multi-classing sidekicks. But we don't have anything that sort of suggests how you would go about doing that, particularly if you were multi-classing into the spell um, spellcaster. If you take levels in, uh, in the warrior and then you pick up uh, a level in spellcaster, how does that work? It's not going to look exactly the same as the multi-classing table in the player's handbook. So just a thing to point out and, and bear in mind. Okay. What do I have to say about the warrior uh, other than that? I think the warrior is the, the sidekick you're going to use the most. It's often what you require to sort of keep the front line intact. Uh, most of the time your players are going to want to play a spell caster, somebody who can cast spells. It is, even if you have a, uh, a character class that, you, that has some sort of front line capacity, most players want to, to play a spellcaster. I have found that the warrior option is a good addition to the game, provided you don't have a particularly large group. Okay, all right, let's have a talk about some of the problems with sidekicks. Sidekicks 
will definitely step on the toes of the Beastmaster Ranger. So my advice to you with the Beastmaster Ranger is don't give player characters a sidekick in a game where you have a Beastmaster Ranger. Okay, if you have a small group and you want to sort of beef up the numbers and somebody has a Beastmaster Ranger, giving them side and people sidekicks is not a good idea. Or your option might be to replace the Beastmaster Ranger's animal companion with a sidekick, which would be far more useful to them. Or if you must give uh, players a sidekick other than the person playing the Beastmaster Ranger in your group, then give the Beastmaster Ranger something extra. What sort of extra features? I'm actually thinking in terms of telepathy with any kind of beast would be really useful. The ability to detect the thoughts of a, a beast, not necessarily any creature, but just beasts, would be incredibly useful for a Beastmaster. I actually think these are features that should have been in the Beastmaster subclass in the first place. And maybe we'll come back to that some other time and discuss it. But just to let you know, you need to be wary if you're going to use sidekicks and there's a Beastmaster. Okay, so my personal opinion. Personally, I like sidekicks, but the sidekick complexity and advancement is just not stripped down enough for what I had intended to use it for. For what I want to use them for, I would have liked something far more stripped down than what we got. Can I strip it down myself? Well, I probably can. I don't think that's going to be terribly difficult. That means if you are feeling like they are still too complicated and you want to strip them down some more, you should be able to do that. I did some videos that talked about how to build animal companions, um, how to do that, and then level them up. And this gives you a really good guidance about you know what you would be looking at and how to do that, and it gives you a chart. So, therefore, it solved a lot of your problems. Okay, now, if you like this content, fantastic. I have a bunch of videos on Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. If Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is not your cup of tea, whether it be player stuff or Dungeon Master tools, then that's fine. I have hundreds of videos for players and Dungeon Masters that cover every aspect of the game, and you're welcome to go and check those out. If you want to support the channel so I keep doing video content like this, you can do that through my Patreon page. The affiliate link's down in the description to Amazon. Uh, check out my merchandise shelf underneath all of my videos, or just watch my videos, that's fine too. Make sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hit the bell button to be uh, notified when I go live, and I go live a lot, and when I publish new videos. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.